In this video, I'll show you the simplest possible digital filter that's incredibly easy to understand and implement on any digital system. I'll be showing you how to do this in real time on an STM32 H7 microcontroller, as you can see on this custom PCB on the right, which is connected to an audio codec. I'll show you this in combination with a function generator, as well as an oscilloscope, so we can check the real time frequency domain and time domain performance of these various digital filters, both as a low pass version and as a high pass version. These are great, really simple filters that you can use, for example, to attenuate high frequency noise from sensors or as a basic audio equalizer, just to name a few examples. I'll guide you through the filter theory, how we can implement it, and then as usual, we'll test these filters in real time to check out their performance. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. The PCB we're going to be using in this video and the one you just saw at the beginning was designed completely using Altium Designer. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to go to the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial to check out the new cool Altium 365 features. If you're interested in the hardware design aspects of this board, make sure to check out video number 78 on my channel, which covers exactly that in far greater detail. The digital filter we'll be looking at is called the Exponential Moving Average Filter. Now the name sounds complicated, the actual implementation and theory is actually rather simple. What we'll be looking at is the basics, also the basics of digital filtering, why we need this filter for example, then we'll look at the theory, looking at low pass and high pass versions, and also implementations along the way. I'll be doing this in C, but of course you can transcribe this into any programming language you want, and I'll be showing you how to do this in real time on an embedded system using an STM32 microcontroller with the PCB we saw at the beginning. Let's start off with an exponential moving average or EMA filter basics. In essence, it's a type of digital filter that utilizes feedback. These filters are oftentimes called IRR or infinite impulse response filters and are one of the most common and easy to implement types of digital filters. I'll only be covering the very basics of these digital filters in this video. If you'd like to go into more detail, I do have an IRR filter video on my channel and that's video number 32. In any case, IRR filters come in very many different flavors. There's Butterworth, Chevy Chef, more complicated filters, high order filters, and so on. However, in many cases, a simple digital filter, a first order EMA filter, for example, which we're looking at in this video, is usually the right way to go. This filter offers very many benefits. First of all, we only need one parameter that we can change. We either have more filtering or we have less filtering. We don't need to worry about cutoff frequencies, bandwidths, and so on. The second benefit is that it's incredibly easy to implement. As we'll see later, there's only a couple of lines of code required. In addition to that, it's incredibly fast computationally, and we also have very low memory requirements, and this makes it fit in pretty much any application. The nice thing about the EMA filter is that it comes as a low pass variant, for example, if you want to attenuate any high frequency noise, for example, and it also comes in a high pass variant. As the name suggests, it lets high frequencies pass through, but attenuates low frequencies. And this can be very useful in certain situations, for example, removing DC offsets or in audio equalizers. As you've probably guessed already, use cases include attenuating high frequency noise, for example, from sensor readings. Let's just say I have an accelerometer that I'm interested in estimating angles with. I'm not really too fussed about high frequency information, so why not use a very simple filter to smooth that out a bit? Alternatively, you might be interested in, in audio and you might want to do some audio processing and you can of course do this with this filter as well, for example, some tone shaping or equalization. We want to implement this as a digital filter. We don't want to always have to change out component values in our analog circuits, changing capacitors, resistors, and so on. Oftentimes these filters are implemented digitally for the sake of changing parameters on the fly and because most of our processing is done digitally anyway. There are some caveats to using digital filters, however. One thing is that we need to move to a discrete time domain. So we're working with samples, we're working, for example, with floating point numbers, and we need to find ways of manipulating those to give us desired frequency domain responses. In any case, in the digital discrete time domain, we are working with quantized samples. This is illustrated in this image in the center here. We have an input array, let's denote that by x, and x of n denotes the input sample at index n. So x of 0 is the 0th input sample, then the next sample is 1, 2, 3, and so on. The time between these samples is typically fixed, and we'll just call this a sampling time t, sample time t, which is related with the sampling frequency by t equals 1 over f. We pass our input array, or our input samples x0, x1, x2, through our digital filter, which we'll just treat as a black box for now, and we'll see how we implement that in a second, and we get output samples, which are typically denoted by the letter y. So for every x, of zero, for every x we get one y out. So a combination of the inputs, 
leads to output samples. Very straightforward. There's actually not much more we need to know when it comes to digital filters to proceed to the EMA filter. The first version we'll be looking at is the low pass filter. We have several diagrams showing essentially very similar things. We have a difference equation at the top, we have a block diagram on the left, and we have this filter's frequency response on the right hand side. Let's look at the frequency response on the right hand side first. On the top graph, we have a magnitude versus frequency. So this is the filter gain or attenuation versus frequency. And the bottom, we have the phase response versus frequency. Predominantly for this filter, we're only interested in the magnitude. So how much gain or how much attenuation do we get at what frequency? Since this is a low pass filter, we can see on the left hand side, for low frequencies, we have a gain in dB of zero, which is a simply a one times linear gain. We're not getting any attenuation and we're not getting any gain at low frequencies, which is what we expect for low pass filter. However, if we move along the X axis to the right hand side, as we increase in frequency, the gain drops or the magnitude drops. This means we're getting attenuation, we're attenuating high frequencies, for example, high frequency noise by a certain amount. This vertical line you see here is the Nyquist limit, which is the sampling rate divided by two. Of course, with a sample system, we have to stay away from that Nyquist limit. This frequency response I've derived from this difference equation up here. And this difference equation is what we then end up implementing very easily in software. If you think of the slide before, X of N is our current input sample, Y of N is our current filter output sample. We also have Y of N minus one, and that's the previous filter output sample. In addition, we can also see this coefficient alpha. So we have alpha times x of n plus one minus alpha times y of n minus one equals y of n. And this is all we need to implement an EMA filter. Let me go into slight more detail. Alpha is a coefficient that we can vary and ranges between zero and one. Let's assume the case that alpha is one. If alpha is one, we can remove the last term here because one minus one is zero. So all we have is y n equals x of n. This means the filter output is the filter input. We get no filtering at all. So for values of alpha close to one, we get minimal filtering. We're only slightly attenuating high frequencies. Let's look at the opposite extreme case when alpha is zero. When alpha is zero, this first term drops to zero and the last term is close to one. Therefore, the current filter output is very close to the previous filter output. This means with alpha close to zero, we get maximum filtering. And this is one of the really nice benefits of the email filter. This is why this is in my eyes, one of the simplest digital filters. When you have one coefficient alpha, which we vary from zero and one, this gives us varying degrees of filtering. So we can attenuate high frequencies more or less depending just by changing alpha. We can also illustrate this as a kind of a block diagram form. And this is where we can see that this filter does use feedback. We take the input on the left hand side, we multiply it by alpha and we add it to another term. The other term is taking the output. This z to the minus one operator is simply a sample delay. So it's making y of n go to y of n minus one. We multiply that one minus alpha and add it to our xn times alpha term. This block diagram is simply visualizing this difference Dif equation at the top. In this way, we can illustrate that this filter uses feedback. This is the way this filter then adjusts the frequency response. It's very, very simple indeed. Again, we just have alpha, which ranges from zero to one. One is minimal filtering, zero is maximum filtering. And we're using the previous output sample for feedback to alter the frequency response. We can vary alpha and then plot the frequency response, for example, using MATLAB. And that's what I've done on this slide over here on the right hand side. When we vary alpha, for example, the blue trace shows alpha at 0 0.1. The orangey trace shows alpha at 0 0.5. Yellow trace shows alpha at 0 0.9. Again, with alpha at 0 0.1, the blue trace, we get much more filtering at high frequencies compared to, for example, the yellow trace where alpha is 0 0.9. Again, alpha is used to vary the amount of filtering and that's all we need to do. Keep in mind though, that we're not really concerned with cutoff frequencies with this filter, because for a lot of alpha values, the cutoff frequency, which is typically determined as the minus three dB point, cannot be defined for high alpha. You can see, for example, in the yellow trace, the cutoff frequency actually never reaches minus three dB, therefore it doesn't make sense to define cutoff frequencies as a figure of merit for this filter. We're simply concerned with alpha between zero and one. What we also can see is that the amount of attenuation, especially for values of alpha that are closer to one, we don't get very much attenuation at high frequencies and we get a pretty shallow roll off. This is to illustrate the point that this filter is great for light filtering, for attenuating some high frequency noise. But if you want a really clear frequency separation, this is probably not the filter you should be using. In any case, let's now implement this filter in C and then look at the results on our embedded system. 
Here we are on STM32 Cube IDE, which I'll be using to program the STM32 microcontroller, as well as where I'll be writing the code. I've already written a small header file for our filter. I've included a struct for our exponential moving average, which simply contains the filter coefficient alpha, which is between zero and one, and the filter output. We need to store the filter output because we'll be using that recursively via feedback to then calculate our new filter output, as we saw from the difference equation. We have three functions. One is the initialization, where we simply reset the output. We store our alpha coefficient. One function where we can store alpha or set alpha, and this is just used so we can clamp alpha between zero and one, only allow legal values, so to speak. Then we finally have the most interesting function, which is the update function, which takes our filter input sample and returns our filter output sample. Now let's write that function together. In the corresponding source file, we can just briefly go to the initialization. We're setting the filter coefficient, clearing the output. In the set alpha function, all I'm doing is clamping alpha in the legal range between zero and one. The update function is now empty. Pulling up the slide with the difference equation on the left hand side and the code window on the right hand side, let's see how we can implement this filter. It turns out it's actually very simple. All we have to do is type in this equation as code. All we have to do is access the filter output variable, so filter out. So the new output is the filter alpha times the current input sample, which is inp, and then we're adding to that one minus alpha times the previous output sample, which is simply filled out. Then the next time this function is called, we already have set filled out, and we're gonna be using that again recursively in our equation here. Then we simply return the filtered output value. Of course, we can do some more like clamping, making sure this is within bounds, but for the values of alpha we've chosen, this filter will be stable. Therefore, this really illustrates the fact that this is one of the simplest digital filters you can implement. I won't be going into detail in this video, but I have covered the initial setup, for example, setting up the I2S, DMA streams, ADC streams, and so on, in video number 55 on my channel. In any case, in my main.c function, all I then have to do is include my EMA header, define a variable for my filter struct. In int main, I just have to initialize my EMA filter, and I've just set the alpha to 0.5 to start with. Then when it's time to process data in my process data function, I take my samples from the ADC, convert them to floats, and then pass that to the EMA update function we just wrote together, passing the filter struct by reference, as well as my current input sample. This function of course then returns the output sample, and this is what I then convert to a signed integer and pass to my DAC buffer. The system I'm using also has various other ADC inputs, for example, for control signals, and I've hooked up some potentiometers, for example, this potentiometer, which can then control the alpha of our filter. So I'm just simply passing one of the ADC readings, which is between zero and one, to the set alpha function we saw earlier, and this will then control the filter cutoff. We're ready to test this out. I've hooked up my ST-Link programmer to my board. All I have to do is click run, wait for this program to compile, so the device is detected, we're uploading the code and we're ready to start. I've hooked up my Analog Discovery Pro, which combines a function generator as well as an oscilloscope, so I'm measuring the input and output to the system. My input is the yellow channel and my output is the blue channel, channel two. What I currently have is a wave gen set up to give me a trapezoidal wave, so not entirely a square wave. I've made these transitions on the edges less sharp by using a trapezoidal wave. Frequency is one kilohertz, amplitude is one volt. Then we can move over to the scope and see what our filter is doing in the time domain. I've mapped one of my other potentiometers to a volume control or gain control, and this controls the overall level of my signal just so I can match input and output levels. We can see the ranges on the right-hand side are both the same, both at 500 millivolts per division, and now I can play around with the alpha. As I decrease alpha, remember alpha going to zero, we're getting maximal filtering. We're not letting any of the input signal through as we decrease alpha all the way to zero. So right now alpha is zero, I've turned my potentiometer all the way counterclockwise, and this ensures that no input signals pass the output, as we can see here. So our filter is behaving as expected. As we increase alpha, we're getting less and less filtering. So we're letting more of the input signal through, we're letting less of the feedback signal pass. We can do this all the way, so we're increasing alpha, increasing alpha, and we're getting closer and closer to this trapezoidal wave. We can see this time delay here, and this is the processing delay essentially we have in the system, as well as some of the phase shift we have due to the filter. You can see the filter is actually distorting some of this original trapezoidal wave because the frequency response isn't entirely flat. So we can see the edges are being rolled off as we increase the filtering. This is what we expect 
the high frequency information in these edges is being lost as we decrease alpha and we increase our filtering. So this looks like it at least works in the time domain. This is what we expect from this filter. Let's move over and do a Bode plot or frequency domain plot of this system. I can do this by going to the waveform software, looking at the network analyzer. I'm looking at channel two only, magnitude on the y-axis is in decibels, frequency on the x-axis. I've selected just from 100 hertz to 20 kilohertz, so in the audio range. My alpha pot's set at a certain value, let's just do a single measurement. We can see the low frequencies, the gain is about zero, which is what we expect. And then we start to roll off very slightly at high frequencies. So at 20 kilohertz, we're only getting an attenuation of about you know, minus eight dB, so not very much. If I decrease alpha, so make it go to zero, we're gonna get more and more filtering. So let me decrease it a tiny bit. In my potentiometer, click a single measurement again. Again, the low frequencies aren't affected, but we'll get more of an attenuation at the high frequencies. Below minus 10 dB at high frequencies, I can turn the potentiometer to make alpha go even closer to zero. We do another single measurement. Again, low frequencies shouldn't be affected as we see here, but we're getting more and more attenuation at high frequencies. Still not very much though, and this is why this filter is not that great in separating frequencies. We just do minimal frequency attenuation at high frequencies. Let me turn it down even further. Let's do a final measurement with alpha fairly close to zero, and you can see now we're finally getting more and more attenuation, about minus 25 dBs at high frequencies. So it looks like our low pass filter seems to be working as expected. We can also turn alpha up all the way, so we hardly get any attenuation at high frequencies as we can see here it's pretty much flat around zero dB. So this looks like our low pass filter implementation, essentially just a couple lines of code is working. Now that we've looked at the low pass EMA filter, we saw this is very simple. We're ready to move over to the high pass, which is slightly more complicated, but still a rather simple filter in comparison to many other digital filters. As before, I've written the difference equation at the top. We have the block diagram, and we also have the Bode or frequency response plot of this filter. We still have one coefficient, but this time I haven't called it alpha, I've called it beta because this acts in a pretty much opposite way to before. Beta still ranges from zero to one, as alpha did. However, beta, when beta is close to zero, we get minimal filtering, and when beta is close to one, we get maximum filtering. Of course, you could rearrange these coefficients and these difference equations to make sure that alpha and beta have similar aspects so that they behave the similar way from zero to one, for example. But in this case, just to illustrate that there is a difference, I've denoted it as alpha and beta. The rear part with feedback is still the same. So this one minus beta or one minus alpha times y of n minus one is still the same. And we can see that in the block diagram. What has changed, however, from the low pass version is the first part of the difference equation as well as the first part of this block diagram. Not only are we concerned with the current input sample, x of n, we're also concerned with the previous input sample, x of n minus one, and we're taking the difference of them, so xn minus xn minus one. This xn minus xn minus one term is very common in high pass filters, and anytime you see a term like this, you can pretty much assume there's gonna be some high pass characteristics to the digital filter. What else has changed is the first coefficient, which has changed to a half times two minus beta. Again, beta is between zero and one. When beta is close to zero, we get minimal filtering, and beta is close to one, we get more filtering. What changes in our implementation is of course the filter coefficients, but also that we need to store the previous input sample. So we need to keep that in mind. We again can look at the effect of our coefficient, Again, we just need one coefficient to change the characteristics of this filter. In this case, for the high pass, we'll call it beta. When beta is 0.1, we can see that in the blue trace, we're getting less filtering, we get a lower cutoff, so to speak, and less attenuation at the DC end of the frequency spectrum. As we increase beta, for example, to 0.5, this orangey red trace in the center, and then increasing beta to 0.9, we're getting far more attenuation overall, as well as a higher cutoff frequency. So the kind of inverse to the alpha coefficient. Now let's see how we can implement this filter in software. Back in STM32 Cube IDE, I've adjusted the code a tiny bit. Of course, it makes sense if you're actually gonna use this in a system to have two separate, for example, classes for both the low pass and the high pass filter. I've just adapted for the sake of time. So alpha has gone to beta, that's pretty much it. However, we also need to store the filter input, which is the previous filter input, in the struct this time. Remember from the difference equation, we need the current input sample and the previous input sample to compute the current filter output. Going to the source file, nothing much has changed. 
other than alpha to beta, of course, and now we have the update function. Again, comparing that to the difference equation, all I've done is taken this difference equation and moved it over to code. So a half times two minus the beta coefficient times the input minus the previous input. Then the previous output section is still the same. All I then need to do is then store the current filter input to make sure we can use that for the next output sample calculation. So I'm just taking the current input and setting that in the struct, which I can then reuse for the next output sample. The main source code has not changed one bit, other than of course alpha to beta, and that's all there is. And now I can run this code again by clicking run. I'm uploading the code to the board, it's detected the device, and we've uploaded the code. In my wave gen, I still have the same trapezoidal wave, and let's try and think what would happen with a high pass filter. High pass filter will not allow any of these DC paths to go through, but we'll only see a change in the output of the filter during these high pass transitions where there's high frequency information. So we should only see the edges once we increase beta. Remember beta again ranges between zero and one. I've mapped that to potentiometer. Beta is zero, minimal filtering. Beta one, maximum filtering. On the scope side, I've got my potentiometer all the way counterclockwise, so beta equals zero, which means we're basically just getting an all pass filter. We're not affecting the signal by too much. Of course, we're gonna have some artifacts as we see here, as well as this time delay. As I start increasing beta, you can see the DC terms are starting to vanish, and we're only getting this transitional pulse. And this is due to these edges of this trapezoidal wave. If you try and remove the time shift in your head, anytime there's this sharp transition, that our filter output, our high pass filter, is giving us a pulse at that transition. Anytime there's DC, we're getting zero at the output. We're not letting any of the low frequency information through. I can increase that even further. And you can see we're attenuating all of the DC or low frequency information, only letting through whenever there's some high frequency information. Again, this is a pretty crummy high pass filter, but enough to do the job in certain cases. For example, when you want to remove DC offsets and so on. You can see that by the distortion of this time domain information. Now let's move over to look at the frequency response. Again, using the network analyzer, I'm gonna start at 20 Hertz, go up to 20 kilohertz. I'm leaving beta fairly high, so getting quite a lot of attenuation at low frequencies. Let's do a single measurement. We can see it being plotted here at high frequencies because this is a high pass filter. We get a gain in dB of zero, which is a linear gain of one. So we're letting high frequencies pass through, but low frequencies, we're getting attenuation of about minus 60 dB right at 20 Hertz. So this looks like our high pass filter is working. Let me reduce the amount of attenuation. So making B smaller, and let's do another single measurement. We can already see our 20 Hertz gain has increased and we're getting less attenuation overall at low frequencies and at around five to seven kilohertz, we're already in the pass band, so to speak. I can reduce beta even further, so we get less attenuation, we don't get such aggressive filtering. And you can see at 20 hertz, now we're getting only about minus 30 dB, and we'll be entering into the pass band far sooner. And there we go, here's our pass band appearing, and it looks like our, our very simple EMA digital filter is working. Again, just with a couple lines of code, you can implement a digital filter very, very easily, and this is fine for a lot of situations. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it enables you to use these very simple digital filters in your next project. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you don't wanna miss any hardware design, embedded firmware or DSP videos. I happen to have a fairly extensive DSP playlist going over FIR filters, IRR filters, Z transforms and anything the DSP heart may desire. So make sure to check that out as well. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.